John, it is so good to see you. Welcome back to the show, Mr. John Woo! Edwards. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What filter are you using there on Zoom? No filter. You have not aged a day in 20 years. I kid you not, it is lighting. I got this down to a science. <laughs> you, 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 you're a beautiful man. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, but you know. I had to have these taken care of a few years ago. These, these are about seven years old, so these are new. Well, they're old. Uh, they're new a, old. Is that the eyelids or the eyebrows? What are you talking about? The eyelid. No, the eyelids. Like seven years ago, I had to have these taken care of because I was like, I could be like a flying squirrel. I'd be able to jump out of a plane and like parachute down. <laughs> <laughs> the so, deciding factor, Darren, is I was at a I was at a confirmation party with my eighty year old uncle, and we did the face swap filter on Snapchat. Yeah. Or whatever. So whatever. And my eyes didn't change. And I was like, oh, that's a problem. So gosh, yeah. these are, these are, they're semi new. I basically say they're in second grade. <laughs> <laughs> so your body is, how old are you now? I'll be 54 in October. 54 and your eyelids are six. Seven. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> what a great combo. <laughs> or, or I don't know. I don't know if I'm supposed to go like 53 minus seven. I'm not really sure how to do that. Like. <laughs> Yeah, you see, they've got very good surgeons there in New York City. So we're chatting to you in your home in New York City. If you haven't guessed it by now, this is the world's greatest. This is numero uno in the world of psychic mediums. This is international psychic medium, Mr. John Edward. Welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It was your grand that was, was and your mom, right? Because your, yep. dad, your dad was a policeman with the, with the NYPD. My dad was a police officer. He was a career military guy. He was not into anything psychic related, but my mom and her family had psychics come to the house all the time. And I did not really, well, first of all, I wasn't allowed to be around it. My dad forbid my mom to have me around it. Then when they divorced, we moved into my grandmother's house. And that's where like this would happen a few times a year. But I had adopted my dad's philosophy and I didn't think that this was legitimate or real. I thought it was kind of like what the ladies do on Sunday or Saturday. It was kind of like a, mm -hmm. like a fun thing for them, but not real. And um, I, I would be the person who would be pulling apart everybody's readings and making fun of everybody. So when people make fun of me, I kind of, I kind of go, I, I get it cause I did it. Mm. So, and I did it when I didn't understand it. So I always give people that are like skeptical a pass when they don't understand because they're coming from a place of not understanding or sometimes being ignorant to what the potential is. Mm -hmm. Once I learned the reality of the subject matter after being told that I had this ability, then my world opened up and then I became an explorer. So everything for me became, how far can I push those boundaries? So for me, it's always about wanting to be better and better. So much so that, you know, there's like people asking me about crossing over, coming back in reruns. And I'm like, Ooh, I don't think, I don't think I'd want that. And they were like, why not? I'm like, well, one, it's a 20 year old version of myself, younger. I'm like, who wants to look at that? Look the I same. Go, and you don't look, you look the same. That, that will land today and will go, it's John Edward 2023. Okay. God bless you. <laughs> but um, the reality is, it's just I the think eyelids it's, that we'll pick up. But, the the eyelids. The eye, right? <laughs> but I will tell you, I think that I'm way better today at doing what I do. That I, I think sure. I would cringe if I looked at that back then. Like, you know, if you went back and looked at your first radio broadcast, you're you're probably so much right you're so much better now today than you are absolutely it's experience you know and and not only experience but it's now the understanding of the process and how i could teach and empower people where before i just felt like i was building a bridge between here and there and just wanted people to know like your dad's with you your grandma's with you your child's with you now it's like they're with you here's the validation of them being with you here's where you're at in your life that was a catalytic, catalytic moment that brought you here. And now we can evolve through it in a different way. So I kind of feel like the space that I'm operating in is like 10 times more than what crossing over was. Mm -hmm. So whenever somebody says, like, would you ever do crossing over again? I'm like, I, I can't do that show because mm -hmm. I'm not that person. anymore. Mm. And so, sorry. So John, so how would you say you've developed and refined your abilities over the years? So the way that the process unfolded for me mm -hmm. was legitimately like pieces of a puzzle, putting it together and then trying to figure out what it is I was looking at. So I still, to this day, right in front of me, 
So on the radio, you won't be able to hear it. But if you're watching this online, I've got a deck of tarot cards. These are like 30 years old. I've been working with these since I was a kid. So they're a lot older than that. They're about 38 years old. Um, that's how long I've been working with these cards. But cards, numerology, any type of tool that would help me to understand symbolism. And then as a result of kind of putting the notes together and learning how to read the music, the compositions kind of came together. So that's how I feel energy is. It's like notes on sheet music. And some people look at it and they just see a whole bunch of like notes on sheet music. Some people can sight read. So I kind of feel like I can sight read and then kind of hear the whole composition. Now, for the people that don't, I mean, there's, there's always a lot of skeptics with, with anything, not, not just what you do. And you've embraced those, those skeptics. And um, I love the, the way that you handle uh, the skeptics, the critics, and all that. So for the, for, for the person that's only listening to this and figuring this out for the first time, I mean, you must get this question a million times a year. What is it like that you see when you are communicating with the other side? I mean, is it is it granny like literally in the coffin there um, that you are communicating with? What is it that, how do you see this? How do you process it? So think about energy as being what you guys are doing right now. You're broadcasting a signal from a building and it's reaching out across a territory that people can pick up and receive your voice and hear what you're saying. Now in radio, not only can they hear you, but they can see you. They can see you as well. So what you choose to show or what you choose to put out as part of your broadcast kind of goes hand in hand. So now people that are listening to you can not only listen to you, but they can see you. Well, if somebody was a studio guest and they came into your studio, they can listen to you, see you, and if you hug them, they can feel you, right? So energy-wise, it's like a three-part process. So I'm seeing energy, I'm seeing it, hearing it, and feeling it, and then I interpret it in my like a three-dimensional way like what am i feeling what am i thinking how am i getting it what does it mean to me and i interpret it in my own reference so i feel like it's like they're trying to get it's like playing pictionary they're trying to get me to say something and how i perceive information is what i'm saying so so you must be hell of a good at charades then oh let me tell you when sandra and i play pictionary there's nobody you, you cannot beat us we're like an unbeatable <laughs> We're like an unbeatable team. It's really, it's funny. Like nobody wanted to play with us. You're that couple. We're that couple. People would be like, we got to split them up. It's not fair. Because like, you know, I would draw a line and she'd be like, house. And they'd be like, how? <laughs> well, you know what? The next time we're together, you and Sandra versus Sam and myself, my wife, we'll take you on right. show raids. But you got no chance against us at 30 seconds. We are undefeated. Every Christmas, I don't even know. undefeated. I don't, I don't even know what that is. 30 seconds. Oh, no. it's the greatest game. Uh, it's not just 30 a... 30 seconds is a South African invention there. Really? It is. Oh, yes, a South African yeah. guy invented it. You have to it. take him a, a copy of 30 seconds. Yeah, it's the greatest game. Greatest game. It's like the, the word version of uh, Pictionary. Really? Yeah. G give me an example. So I'll get a card that's got five words on it. So it'll have one Mickey Mouse, two um, uh, England, three um, a TV show, a celebrity, Charlize Theron. Da -da -da. So then you, you go 30. So now Sherlin and I are a team. Mm -hmm. Now I've got to, she's got to guess one through to five without saying, without me saying the actual word. So I'll go, and Sherlin's an absolute champion at this. Mm -hmm. I'll go, okay, so... Bear in mind, I'm looking at something that says Mickey Mouse. So I'll have to go, all right, um, Disneyland, the main character at Disneyland. Mickey Mouse. Okay, then, so now the next one is like, so you've got to go through the five inside of 30 seconds. So if your name was in, on the card, for instance, John, I would say American Psychic had his own TV show, has been to South Africa. John Edward. Yes. Good, and then you move on. It's a lot of fun, a lot of hype. Very heated. I want to know the results. You versus your wife, John, and his wife. Who would win? Who's yeah. that couple? I'm feeling a Zoom coming on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, now, John, something else that uh, I wanted to touch on, and, and you told me this many, many years ago when my father passed away, and as you know, my brother also passed away. Um, and people see this as crazy. I do it in my own time. Um, I can be walking along the road and I will see a feather on the pavement. 
I'll pick it up. I'll put it in my pocket. People say, what you doing there? And I'll say, no, it's, it's fine. Don't worry. I, I, I wouldn't even start to explain to somebody if I thought they were going to think I'm crazy. Um, but John told me about looking for signals around you with mm -hmm. people that have passed on. And for me, that communication is via feathers. And it's funny that it comes to me often if I am talking talking to my, my lost ones, my lost loved ones, and I might be searching for an answer. And the next day, or even then, there'll be a feather in the most uncanny place, like in- That's the part, that, uh, that's the part you need to put in there, yeah. I'm not at a bird park mm -hmm. picking up feathers. This is like in the middle of my house, in the middle of winter, there's not a window open. How on earth does a feather get there? Almost like it was magically placed there. Yeah. Now, can you explain that, please, John? I wish I could, Darren, because I've had experiences that are like that. And my brain is way analytical and logical. And I look to kind of pull apart stuff before I go to the, oh, wow, that's like a psychic thing. I always want to not reach for something. I want to allow it to be what it is. But I had that exact feeling, that, that exact experience in a blizzard in New York. Um, we were snowed in for like four days and I had to go out the front of my grandmother's house, the window, to shovel out the front door, do the driveway, get down to my car, shovel all of that out to get in. And when I got in, I was freezing, got in the car, started it, looked on my passenger seat and there was a feather that was like, like this big. Mm. And I just was like, I looked at it and I'm like, it is the middle of winter. How? The birds have headed and south I, already. I, I, I picked it up. I had it in my hand. So it wasn't like I psychically saw it, you know, like I had, I touched it. And because the weather was kind of crappy, I didn't want it to get damaged going from the car to the house. So I left it there. And when I went back the next day, it was gone in the same way that it showed up. I cannot explain that. So and I'm not that person. Like when somebody tells me these stories, I, I always like kind of listen and go, mm hmm. Like they, did they want it? Did they really want it? There was a feather in a blizzard in my car mm. that should not have been there. And I cannot explain why it was there. So mm. over the course of four decades, I've had multiple stories. A lot of them I can explain away. A lot of them I can go, logically, I understand. But there'll be interesting moments. Like I remember flying, I think it was on the anniversary of my mom's passing. And I was um, really, really tired. And I got on the plane and I put my head up against the window. And I looked into the window and I never noticed this before, but on a plane, there's a window to the outside there's a window to the inside, mm. a space in between, and a little hole up on top. Yeah. There was a feather in in the in the glass. Goodness me! On my mom's anniversary. So there's a lot of those little moments. So I call those the ABCs of of connection, and everybody gets them. Like where they'll find feathers, they'll see dragonflies, hummingbirds, cardinals, birds of all different, you know, anything of flight, butterflies, um, anything that could symbolically represent, you know, if if somebody's um, symbol for their loved one was an elephant then they might be seeing symbolism of elephants. If mm. somebody's symbol of a loved one is a religious icon, they might start seeing images or symbolism of that. Sometimes it's food. Whatever that pattern is, it becomes that game mm. of charades, that moment of the 30 seconds where you have the ability to go, oh my God, it's that, because it triggers that. Yeah. And then one of the things that I love when people experience is our, our smells, where they'll get a scent of something and they go, Oh my God, that's my grandmother's perfume. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I've had that before. Because I, to give you a, a very real example, and, I, and I've never told anybody but my wife this, so I'll, I'll tell you now, with the feather. Um, so this happened shortly after my father passed away. So in the middle of my house in Joburg, mm -hmm. I had a pool table. Now, I'm, I've always been a, a pool player, snooker player. You know that. And... Whenever my dad used to come to my house, that was our thing. My dad was a snooker player. My grandfather was a snooker player. That was our table. Much to my wife's dismay that there's a pool table in the middle of the house, she was like, this is yours and your dad's thing. So then he passes away. And it was about two weeks or three weeks after that. Mm -hmm. I had a few friends around for a bra. And they see the pool table and they're like, hey, let's have a game. And I was like, you know what, you guys play. And I didn't tell them why I didn't want to play because the last time I played on the table was with my father. So I said, you guys just play, just have some fun, you know what, and I just changed the subject. 
the very next morning I woke up and I came downstairs and there was a feather on that pool table. Oh, wow. And for me, that was a sign from my dad saying, you know what? You play, I'm here with you. Mm. And I've never missed a shot since. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, so yeah. I think, I think it's beautiful that you have that perspective because I don't think as a, I mean, I don't know about South Africa, but I know here in the States, I don't think that people are prepared for death. I don't think that people talk about death. Mm -hmm. People don't talk about um, their loved ones in spirit. And it, it, it's better now than it's been. But I think death is the thing that's promised to all of us, but yet it's the thing that's taboo and we don't talk about. Mm. And one of the greatest moments, one of my greatest experiences in the entirety of my career was walking on stage at the Lyric Theater in Joburg. Mm. And one of the people that worked at the stage came up to me and said, you know, we don't need you here. And I looked at him and I was like, okay. He goes, I mean, no disrespect. He says, but we as a culture are very plugged into our ancestors. He goes, so I know that they're going to help you get it right. Wow. And I just was like, that was the coolest like statement. Yeah. Because to me, I think that's the goal mm -hmm. for everybody to have a connection to their heritage, their ancestors, to know where they came from. And by the way, in every aspect of life. So like if somebody in a, in a business or professional sense came before you and paved the way and made it possible for you to stand on their shoulders, I always think it's important to know where where you come from in that respect as well, as well as the DNA. So I think it's important to always honor the roots of where we come from. And part of that is by acknowledging those who've crossed. Yeah. And I think to have that connection and recognizing the feather on the table mm -hmm. is a great bridge that you build to your dad and that you know that you can now say to your kids, hey, this is how grandpa communicates with me. And it, it shows a pattern without talking about it. Mm. So that gets planted. Because one day when you're not here, then they have that as a story that they reflect back on, that they know that they can communicate. Like I always tell my kids since they're very, very young, hey, in case they get abducted by aliens, I want you to know this. <laughs> and it's my way of making sure that I'm giving them information and saying things, but I'm couching it in a way that they're going to hear it. The message, not the, hey, in case I die, I want you to know this. But like in case I get abducted by aliens, I want you to know this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. So, John, earlier you said that you weren't always a believer like your dad, no. you know. Um, what changed? What what happened? What made you believe? Um, I had a reading with a woman named Lydia Clark. And there were people that had come to my grandmother's house before and they kind of, they were um, caricatures that you would typically think of I'm trying to be polite in how I say this. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I would have fun with either how they spoke or how they looked and then what they said. And then I would tease, like tease my family, my cousins. This was a, a regular person. She was, a, you know, she had some cool eyeliner. That was about it. Um, and she read 17 people, I believe that day. And one by one, they went up to the room and one by one, they came out with this like hollowed out, whoa, kind of vibe. And it was different. It was a very different experience than all the rest of them that had been in the house before. And um, I wound up being read by her. And I remember saying to my mom, can I do it? And she said, you can, but you have to treat her with respect. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I will treat her with respect but I'm not going to help her like the rest of you. Because I was convinced this woman was extrapolating information out of my cousins and family and friends. And then she took my high school ring, held it in her hand, went down like this, put her palm, you know, her, her fist to her forehead and began speaking and never really looked at me for like the first half of the reading. And she was very commanding and didn't care that I believed or disbelieved, she just gave me what she got. And it was scary accurate. And when the reading was over, the level of accuracy was so uncomfortable for me. And I say uncomfortable, and I always put this out there when people ask me these questions. I was not a believer. So when you have somebody do that to you, your feeling is either gonna be wonder and wow, or violation. Mm. I fell on 
violation side. I was like, oh, I don't like this. Oh, I don't like this. This is not cool. So in that reading, she told me that I had this ability and that the reason why she came that day was so that she could meet me and put me on my path. Like that was like the whole impetus of her being there. Cause she really wasn't somebody that like did house parties. Like it's not her thing, mm -hmm. but she came because she wanted to meet me and put me on my path. And I went to the local public library and I read every single thing I can get my hands on. And as I gained knowledge coming from a place of being ignorant, gaining knowledge, my ignorance slash arrogance of being a 15 year old became wonder and like I became quizzical, like inquisitive. I wanted to know more. And then I started going, but this isn't psychic. Like this is like, we all do this. Like everybody has this and everybody does. But I started to realize that my having it was maybe a little bit deeper than other people having it. And I was just raised in an environment where people didn't really notice or make a big deal. Like it wasn't something that I put my attention on it and it became like, like working out. It's like putting your attention, like we all have muscles, but if you put your weights, if you start lifting weights, it gets stronger. So I started lifting psychic weights and I got stronger. And uh, how many times have the uh, FBI or CIA phoned you and said, Hey John, we need to find this guy. Uh, no, no CIA. <laughs> <laughs> FBI. Just one. <laughs> <laughs> How many times? Is this all classified? Uh, well, it's going to be unclassified next year because he's writing a book about it. So really? there's a book coming out. Yeah. And is this, um, so, so were you tapped quite often by this, uh, this detective to... Was it a detective? He was an FBI agent. FBI agent, yeah. Um, and I always say it's not, I didn't help him solve anything. Like my job wasn't to solve the way I can't fix somebody's grief and I can't fix somebody's problems. I can go, I can give insights and shine a light on something and say, you may want to look here. That's what I would do. I would give him insights and information. And then he would just have that like on the sidelines. He still did his job. Um, you know, and I just asked him always keep my name out of this. And he was like, no problem. Cause I don't want to get fired. So we, we had a, we had a great, <laughs> we had a great like working relationship for like two decades um matter of fact we were just talking yesterday i'm just picturing this guy on his, doing his kpr and they say so uh you work very hard but no i actually don't do any work i just phone john he solves all my cases for me he I does do, the heavy uh, lifting for me i do no detective work myself he says in the forest behind the third tree dig two meters there's the body if only <laughs> yeah. if only it happened like that you know, a lot of the conversations would go, I would get information and they'd be like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? I'm like, I don't know. I don't do this. Here you go. So <laughs> but it's it's been a very, very unique relationship. And and we just had a conversation yesterday regarding the book that he's writing. And one of the things that he, you know, he said very emphatically is, you know, what's what's important for everybody to know when I when this comes out is that I never tried to prove you right. If anything, I tried to prove you wrong. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I was yeah. like, wow, 20 years ago, kind of cool. And, and John, have there ever been instances where you were unable to connect with someone who's already passed on? Sure. Yeah, I've had private sessions where I couldn't, couldn't make a connection with the person. I've been, I was tested at the University of Arizona. And I remember one time I didn't get anything on somebody. I've done Larry King Live and I couldn't pick up on a person that was a caller. It happens. But I always say that it's me not being able to tune into that person's frequency. Oh. So if I can't tune into the frequency of your radio station, that doesn't mean that you don't exist. It doesn't mean that you're not talking. It doesn't mean that you're not playing music. It just means that the radio's not picking up the signal. Mm -hmm. So I would go to the place of I'm not getting it so that the family and friends of the people that are living don't go, there's something wrong with them. They're not okay. Um, I always say like, as the radio, I can't, I can't tune in the frequency. Um, unfortunately, other people in my world will say it's the person that's passed. They need more prayers. They're not okay. They're not settled, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I don't like seeing that. So to me, it's all about understanding they're fine. We're not, we have to work on being fine. We work on being fine by holding on to our faith, um, our belief systems and allowing ourselves to think about the potential that there's a survival of consciousness and that life and love are eternal and then be open, not look, but be open to the possibilities of how they may come through to you. And you could have three siblings. You have three sisters in a family 
dad could be passed. Dad could come through to all three sisters differently. Mm. One might get a sense of him. One might dream of him. One might find feathers. Yeah. And and John, what do you say? You, you mentioned prayer there. What do you say? I mean, a lot of people that are sort of, um, I mean, religious, but very religious that go, this messes with my belief system. What do I say? I don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, what do you have? N- nothing. I don't really care. Um, we were doing a we were doing an event in uh, Pasadena. I think it was Pasadena, California, and um, my cousin Katrina runs like all my events and stuff. And she said, "Hey, we we might be delayed." And I said, "Okay." which was fine because I was sitting in California traffic. So I was like worried about being delayed myself. So I was like, phew. Um, and I go, why, what's the, what's the matter? And she goes, you have protesters. And I was like, protesters? I have protesters? And she goes, yeah, you have protesters. I go, like somebody's like standing outside handing out pamphlets. And she goes, no. She goes, you've got like 20 or 30 people, like LED signs, bullhorns. They're like, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big deal. The, the cops are here to try to keep it organized. And I was like, and I got really, really quiet. And she goes to me, should I not have told that to you before the event? Like, is that gonna mess with your head? And I just started to laugh and I was like, no. I go, I'm actually, I'm actually pretty honored. And she's like, why? I go, I don't know, it makes me feel relevant. Like, <laughs> do you know how much organization had to go in to protesting? They had to make signs. They had to have at least a few meetings. So yeah. I said to her, I go, can we call, can we order them pizza? And she goes, are you out of your mind? I go, listen, protesting takes a lot of energy. We should make sure that they're well fed. And she hung up like, these people are driving me crazy today. Like, are you nuts? <laughs> oh, man. Listen, um, John, have, have you seen the story? I didn't know this. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a proper sort of mess issue that Disney World has in Florida. It's like the number one spot in America for people to scatter the ashes of their beloved ones outside Cinderella's palace, outside the in the haunted mansion. It's probably properly haunted. It's not even just fake actors there. Um, Funny. Just inside the gate. It, it's like the number one dying wish of an American is to be have the at- ashes scattered inside Disneyland and then what happens is is if they do catch you because it's illegal they said you know you're not allowed to do this now and if they do catch you then they they come with their broom and their um, little scoop they scoop up the ashes and they give it back to you and say yeah take daddy somewhere else I did not know that yeah it's like I mean you're getting rejected even when you're dead I think Florida's got bigger issues than that I've, I've read, yes. <laughs> I've got way big issues in that. That should be. John, the legend of international psychic mediums. This man, is, is your waiting list still like three years if you want to get a private reading somewhere around there? So I don't even, I don't even have a waiting list any longer, Darren. Now it's an interest list. And the reason why I call it that is that we randomly select people when the private readings become available because I don't want the pressure of, like I had a I had a waiting list that was eight years long at one point, wow. and then I got through it. I got sure. through it, and then I was like, okay, that's it. I'm not doing that again. As a lot, I'm OCD, so I was like, I had to do it in the order that they were on it. Unfortunately, some of the people that were on it had passed, and I wound up talking to their relatives. So it was like that was even, it was a lot. So I didn't want that kind of pressure. But um, I launched an app called Evolve Plus, and on that app, I actually do readings. So I go live on there. I do readings on there. Um, I have a whole channel that's on it. Well, um, how lucky are you? Because John is going to do another set of readings for us. How special. No waiting list. Yes. Right. You can jump the queue, Western Cape, for a reading. You know, people know that I know you, and I get requests all over the world please i need a reading with john edward and i just Aww. say i just say you know what if it's meant to be it's meant to be if it's mm. not it's not 
So, John, you provide and have provided so many people with like closure and comfort. There are so many stories. Is there one that stands out? Well, I think I provide people with connection and mm -hmm. I think it helps them to realize that maybe they don't need the closure that they think they have. Because when we look at closure, it's like putting a period to the end of a statement. Mm -hmm. And I think we want to put like a dash. We want the relationship to 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 continue. I think when when I think about the amount of people that I've encountered and worked with, I can't pick a story. But I can tell you that when you encounter a person that's in deep grief and there's like darkness in their eyes, when you watch the lights go on in their eyes again, that vitality kicks in, that is like a mm. special, it's like winning the lottery. It's, it's such a humbling feeling um, because they know that they know that that loved one's still with them. They know now, you know, and, and it's interesting because I've got like on this, on this new app, somebody wrote yesterday, they wrote a whole paragraph of a post about how I read them at one of my events mm -hmm. and the level of skeptic. Now they're a fan. They're, they're a fan of the subject matter. They're a fan of the show. They're a fan of mine. They're on this platform. But after I read them, to see how they still had that level of skepticism and pulled apart their entire reading until they got to a place where they couldn't and information had to be validated outside of them. And in this paragraph, they wrote like, for anybody reading this, please know this is not something anybody could research, anybody could know. So please don't come at me with, you know, it was this, it was that, it was this. Mm. This is my family's way of coming. That, that validation is huge to me. Like, I love reading that. You know, that's, that's the that was my favorite part about the show was watching people validate what happened. You know, we used to, as I say, watch you on TV and you you, you mesmerized everybody with your abilities and people were like, what's this guy? What does this guy do? How does he do this stuff? You know, uh, is it legit? Is it not? And then um, when, when my brother passed away, I saw on my, somebody had given my mom your first book. One last time. Yeah and one last time and she'd finished reading it and then i picked it up and i read it and it gave me the most unbelievable comfort because oh. you know i was i was uh, 22 when my brother passed away mm -hmm. you know and i'm sitting there wondering I mean, my grandparents passed away, but I was, uh, they passed away before I was even born. Mm -hmm. So that was the first loss that I experienced. And I was trying to process this, like, okay, wait, he's gone, but how can it be? Is this a bad dream? I, I, I didn't know how to go, okay, he's dead. I'm never going to see him again. Mm -hmm. And I read your book and people that know me, I'm not a book reader. But your book absolutely captivated me and I read it from start to finish, like in two days. And the comfort and healing that I got from that, because I left with the conclusion, this is not the end. This is, he's here. He's around me. He's in everything that I do. And this is not even in sort of a spiritual sense. This is even like in the physical sense. You know what I mean? Like with the feathers and stuff. He's here, you know, when I need him. And all the grief just disappeared. Mm. And then I thought, so there is life after death. Mm. And that, that healed not only me, but my entire family. Well, thank you. It was very powerful, very powerful. So, so that is what, you don't even have to have a reading from John Edward. Mm -hmm. You just need, for me it was about Somebody can tell me, yes, there's an afterlife, but you need to convince me that there's an afterlife and then I will find the peace. So the convincing is the critical part of the equation. Mm -hmm. And that comes See, when I, John does a reading and you go, there's no ways he knew that I was looking at a bowl of spaghetti this morning thinking about you. There's no ways. Mm -hmm. All right. Then you get that comfort and then you go, well, he can't make that up. So this person must be out there. That, that's the moment that I'm talking about. You got it from the book. Now, it's interesting in all the years that I know you, I didn't know that story. 
I I thought that your introduction to me was when I pulled you out of the one studio and into the other studio. That's how I thought. That's what I thought your your introduction. I didn't know that. No, I, I, I'll even walk this back even further. So I was always I was always in your camp from from when my brother died, right? And then fast forward um, two or three years later, um, I just happened to be at the Lyric Theater, mm -hmm. that show that John was talking about, trying to book my one-man stand-up show. And I was speaking to a lady who is now a mutual friend of ours, Debbie Batsoffin. She was the booking agent for the theater. And I went then, because and, and, I was on the phone, I said, Debbie, do you have this date? No, I don't have this date. Do you have this date? No, that's not available. She said, can you just come in and have a look at the schedule? It's going to make my job a lot easier. So I went down there, and she said, okay, here's the calendar. These are the dates. And I'm looking, okay, there's uh, Tevin Campbell coming on the 13th of September. Then I'm like, John Edward booked in November. Mm -hmm. I said, is this... John Edward, the psychic medium. She says, yeah, have you heard of him? I said, oh my goodness. I said, please, I need to have him on the show, on the radio show. So she says, serious? I said, yes, of course, I want him. And then that's when she made contact with you, John, and said, this guy wants to speak to you on, his, on the radio show. And then that happened after that. It was yeah. meant yeah, to be. I, crazy, well, I'm happy. I'm, yeah. I'm happy that we met. I'm happy that we, we connected and, and, yeah. and we're talking today. And, and thank you for the validation because it's, it means a lot. Yeah. No, thank you for, for the comfort, John, and, and for what I needed, you know. And, and I just, that's why, I, I mean, I just love exposing you to people because I know what you did for me, you can do for millions of people out there, you know. It's just, it's, 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 words can't adequately describe what you do for people. So, yeah, John Edward. Oh, how hey. special. Thank you so much, Darren, that I'm humbled beyond words. <laughs> well, it's, it's my pleasure, John. So listen, we're going to set a date for some readings down the line, and uh, you can experience firsthand what John Edward can do. The most fun. To make you feel great. Wakey, wakey, rise and shine. KFM mornings with Darren Shirley and Monday to Friday, 6 to 9 a.m.